Hi, everybody, and welcome to Digital VLSI Design. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar-Ilan University, and now we'll be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 2, Verilog HDL. And the first question out of 10 is, what type of block is this? Always at star, out equals A and B and C. Is it a sequential block, a combinational block, both sequential and combinational block, or neither sequential nor combinational block? Well, I believe it's a combinational block. And let me remind you why it's a combinational block. As we saw in the lecture, there are two types of always blocks. There's a sequential always block and a combinational always block. A sequential um, always block has a, a sensitivity to the clock. So in its sensitivity list, we have a clock. We may also have a reset. Um, and we use these non-blocking assignments for them. A combinational block, on the other hand, is an always block that has in its sensitivity list a bunch of signals. So here we have always at A or B or C, but we could have just replaced the A or B or C with the star notation here, which came in in Verilog 2001, and it reduces uh, all kinds of bugs. What it does, it takes all the right-hand side uh, parameters and it sticks them in the sensitivity list automatically. So anytime there is a change in A, or B, and C over here, we go into this always block and figure out what the new value of out is. Okay, so that is a, a so what we showed before is obviously a combinational block. Which of the following is not a way to define a multiplexer in Verilog? Mux out cell in one. Assign out equals cell. Question mark A colon B. Always at A or B or cell. If cell, then out equals A. Else out equals B. Always at A or B or S. Begin case S. And time. So there. Are three ways, maybe more, to make a mux, okay? We can use an assign statement. So we have a wire that's called out, and then we use a sign which sits outside of any of the always blocks, and we have out equals cell. This is the ternary type operator, so cell. What is the value of cell? If cell is 1, then we return A, else we return B. So that's a cool and tight way to write a mux. Okay, we can also do it in a more elaborate way, which is using an always, a combinational always block. Here, the, um, the uh, signals that are on the left-hand side in an always block, either combinational or sequential, are always of type reg in Verilog. Okay, so always at A or B or cell, or we could just write always at star. If cell equals 1, then out equals A, so that's the same as here. If cell equals 1, then out equals A, else out equals B else out equals B. So that was uh, one way to do it. And on the left hand side we had out, so it's a reg as you see, and we make sure that A and B which are right hand side and cell which is the if uh, condition is also a considered a right hand side, they have to be inside our sensitivity list or else we could have latch inference. Okay, and we could use a case statement inside um, this uh, always block. So again, we uh, make out a type reg because it's going to be on the left hand side of an always block. And we again have A or B or cell. We, we have a begin and end. Um, case, we ask what the value of cell is. If cell is 0, then out equals B. If cell is 1, then out equals A. Um, so those are three different ways to make a uh, case statement. Now, what happened in the Kahoot, I also gave uh, this mux out cell in 1, in 2, which is a, a kind of a way to show a, pr a primitive, but there is no primitive of mux in Verilog, so that was kind of a, a fake answer. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Which of these is not a legitimate constant in Verilog? 8BX, 5B14, 3B, X, Y, Z, 12, H, A, B, C. Hmm, this one's hard. What are we allowed to do or not? I don't ever remember having a Y over here, so let's choose this one. Yeah, okay. So um, let's remember what our constants were in Verilog, okay? So um, the constant format is the width in bits with this little apostrophe here, and then the binary value um, of the, uh, or, or, 
excuse me, the uh, radix over here and the value. So, for example, one tag B0 means it's one bit, okay? It's binary encoded. B is for binary encoded, and the value is zero. Here we have four tag B0011, so here it was four bits, so we have four binary digits over here, okay? Eight tag H, H for hexadecimal, okay? And then hexa, it goes up to F, so FF, that would be 1111, 1111. And that's eight bits. So the eight over here is how many binary bits there are. And eight tag D255. So here we encoded this in decimal. And decimal 255 is the same as uh, as our FF over here. Um, so that's, uh, but we can write it with a decimal notation if we want. It's going to be translated into bits. So we have to figure out what the width in bits is that we need for that. Okay. So let's take a look again at our answers. So eight, uh, um, eight tag b x so an x is a legitimate um, value in verilog so we basically have four main logic values one and zero of course and x and z x means that it, it is something that's either uh, multi-driven which is uh, against the rules or it's something that hasn't been instantiated hasn't been given a reset value but it's something that's used for simulation not for synthesis you can't synthesize an x i hope but if it appears in your simulation and usually is in red, it tells you that either something hasn't, hasn't been initialized or that you have some sort of problem of a multi-driven net. So um, that's why we use an X. So 8-BX is for sure a, um, con uh, a constant that can be used. Um, it could be XXXXXXX for the 8 bits, but um, all the simulators and so forth, they know how to expand that to the width that we wrote over here. Okay, 5-D14. So if you think about it, 14 bits will go into five binary bits. Five binary bits are uh, give us a maximum of 31. Uh, so uh, 14 in decimal will fit into that. So that is a fine uh, and legitimate constant. 12 dash H A B C. Well, in hexadecimal, each one of these bits is actually four uh, uh, four binary bits. Okay, and A, B, and C are just, you know, 10, 11, and 12 in hexa. So 12 dash H, A, B, C is a very legitimate number. However, on the other hand, 3 dash B, X, Y, Z is not, because Y is not a uh, legitimate value. X and Z, on the other hand, are. So that's why that is the wrong answer. Oh, luckily I got that one right. And here we have number four, sequential blocks. Mark the correct answer. So sequential blocks always use the blocking assignment, always use the non-blocking assignment. You can assign a flip-flop within both sequential and combinational blocks and use star in your sensitivity list. So which one is correct for a sequential block? I will guess it's our one in blue. So this is a very important point that we, we discussed and uh, let's go over to our slides again. And we see that um, we have uh, Three types of assignments continuous assignments which are outside of always blocks and these are these assigns and they use this equals which i guess you could call a blocking assignment but it doesn't matter it's the, it's just the operator that is used for an assign then we have a blocking procedural assignment which is this equals and that we only use inside a combinational block and it's similar to what we have in traditional programming where the first line is evaluated before the second line happens and the third line happens and so forth. Um, we can see such a thing uh, in general as something like logic gates. So if we have a logic gate that is then connected to another logic gate, to another logic gate, etc., this will happen sequentially. So this happens after this, after this, after this. So that's really a combinational logic path. And that's why we use a blocking assignment there. Um, on the other hand, this uh, um, smaller than equals is called a non-blocking assignment. And for a non-blocking assignment, what happens is that we execute, we figure out what the value is on the right-hand side, and then we um, uh, assign it to the left-hand side at the same time. And what is the same time? That is a, uh, a singular moment in time, and it only should happen really inside a flip-flop when we have a rising edge of the clock, for example, that at that exact immediate time of the rising edge of the clock, everything that has been waiting before is assigned. And that's why we use a non-blocking assignment. Okay, so basically what we have here is a flip-flop, okay, and this is a net 
that's after the flip-flop. So this is like, let's say this is our state variable or something like that. And what goes into the flip-flop at the D input, right? That's going to be our next state or uh, whatever is waiting to be evaluated. Okay. And when the clock rises over here, then we're going to take our next state and move it to state. And if we assign mini flip-flops in the same always block, we are, we're going to want that to happen at the same time because they're all getting the same clock. And that's why we use this non-blocking assignment. Now, what you have to do is follow these rules that combinational always blocks use blocking assignments and sequential always block use non-blocking assignments. You have to follow those rules. Never do uh, anything different. So now let's go um, back to our Kahoot and see what about the other one. So always use blocking assignment or always use non-blocking assignment. And for sequential blocks, we just showed that it always has to be a non-blocking assignment. Um, what about this? You can assign a flip-flop within both sequential and combinational blocks. So that's kind of a, a stupid type of a sentence because a sequential block is a block that makes a flip-flop or a latch. So a combinational block is by definition one that doesn't have any type of a sequential element like a flip-flop inside. So this is obviously wrong. And finally, use star in your sensitivity list. So that is something that we said you should always use star in your sensitivity list, but on a combinational block, not on a sequential block. So that's not right in the case of this question. Okay, let's go to the next question. So mark the incorrect rule. Combinational always block, use blocking assignment. Sequential always block, use non-blocking assignment. Well, we just saw that we know that these two are both correct, so neither of them are incorrect. So it comes out between the yellow and the green. A variable can be assigned left-hand side in only one always block, or a variable can be assigned left-hand side only once in an always block. That's not right. So let's try to understand that. So first of all, if we go back to our... Um, if, if we go back, uh, first of all, if we go back to our um, assignments uh, slide over here, it says, do not assign the same variable for more than one always block. So that's a big no-no, and that's exactly, basically, um, what it says here. Uh, a, a variable could be assigned left-hand side in only one always block. If two always blocks are assigning the same variable, that means we have something multi-driven. That means that there are two logic gates that are driving the same net. It could be two flip-flops or it could be two um, combinational blocks if it's a combinational if it's in two separate combinational uh, uh, two separate combinational always blocks, then it would be like two ands that their output is is, is connected together. And if it's uh, two sequential blocks, then it would be two um, flip-flops that their output is connected together. So that is something that we really, really cannot do and you have to really be careful of. Uh, an, an always, uh, only one always block can assign a left-hand side inside your module. Okay. By the way, just pay attention. It could be that in a different module you're assigning that variable because the variable is local to the module. Maybe two modules both have a signal called state or something. So it could be in two separate modules. But in the same module, you can only assign a variable from one always block. On the other hand, you can assign, um, or you usually do, assign a variable several times in an always block. Just look at our, for example, our uh, regular flip-flop. We say if um, not reset, then q equals 0, else q equals um, one, uh, d, right? So that was twice that we assigned q inside our always block. And that's for a sequential block, but the same thing is with a um, uh, combinational block. We have a case, and for each each of the case options, um, we have a, a, a assignment to the same variable. In fact, if we don't have an assignment, then that will cause latch inference because we have to save save the previous state. So, um, so this, of course, is a wrong rule. Um, yes, of course, a variable can be assigned many times inside an always block. Okay, question number six. The following code describes what? Reg Q always at pause edge clock or negative reset if not reset q equals zero else q gets d so is that a d flip-flop with low synchronous reset a d flip-flop with low asynchronous reset a positive latch a positive level d latch with low reset or a d flip-flop with high synchronous reset? well if you remember correctly we go into this block either on clock or on reset that means it's not synchronous so it's a d flip-flop with low asynchronous reset let's hope on time. I was a bit stressed for time. And I did press the right one. Okay, so again, here, 
as we can see, always at pause edge clock or negative reset. That means that we're going to go into this block according to the sensitivity list, either when the clock rises, which is a synchronous type of an operation, but also when reset asynchronously will fall. Okay, uh, the underscore here doesn't mean anything. That's just the name of the signal is reset underscore. That's a string. But since it has neg edge, it means it's going to go in here when reset goes from high to low. So the first thing we do is we ask what the state of reset is. As long as we're um, uh, not in reset, reset's going to be high. So we ask if not reset. That means if reset is high, if it's not low, okay, then we're not in reset. And then we um, assign the output to, to the input. So Q gets D. But if we did reset, that means that reset is now at zero. It fell from one to zero. That means Q gets zero and we reset uh, the net. Okay, um, just uh, another mention. If we have synchronous reset, that means that we would only have always at pause edge clock. We wouldn't have this negative reset part. Uh, um, and then we only go into the block on the clock edge, not asynchronously when reset changes. Okay, if it was a latch, we would have, um, and we wouldn't have this pause edge here. We would have a level, like always at clock. So that is the difference basically between declaring a, a latch and a flip flop. Mark the wrong guideline. Each module name should be in a separate file, module.v. Always connect modules by name. .in1 gets in1. Separate sequential and combinational logic. Never use assigned statements. Well, that's pretty obvious. I showed you assigned statements. There's no reason not to use them. Okay, so let me go back to our uh, lectures over here. And we have this slide about organizing your code. Each module name should be in a separate file, and we should name the file module.v. So that was one of our things that we said. Why do we do that? Well, um, it, there are two main reasons uh, to, to do this. Number one is if we have some sort of a syntax error or we want to uh, find something, it, it will always tell us what the module name is. And it's really easy to find the module name when there's only one module in a file. We just go to the file with the same name as the module that we're looking for. So that's a real easy way to do it. The other thing is it's really easy for code reuse, right? We can take a module that was written by somebody else and just plug it into our, we can replace one module with another just by, you know, changing a single file. We don't have to take pieces from a certain file or so forth. And it doesn't cost you anything to have more files in your file system. It can be a real short file with a real short module, or it can be a long file with a uh, long module. But we put each module in a separate file, and we call it module name .v. Okay. The other thing is always connect modules by name. So you can connect things by reference um, in, in Verilog. Uh, a lot of uh, machine language, uh, machine uh, type algorithms do that. Probably your netlister will come out with things uh, connected by reference, by, by the, the p point where it is, but that's unreadable. So we always want to use this uh, dot form, which means that we write the signal name dot dot, uh, you know, dot signal name is connected to signal name. We're always going to do that when we instantiate a uh, uh, something it makes it much more readable much more um, debuggable and so forth and also if somebody changes the um, the uh, order of the module declaration then it won't then it won't affect it so it costs us a little bit in typing for the moment when we write the instantiation but it, it helps us not have bugs okay another few things are write each input and output on a separate line like over here it just again helps us to make sure we see everything that we're doing and and uh, helps us debug uh, things. It also helps us to comment on what each signal is used for. That's not a must, but it's something that, uh, that is commonly done, at least to a point. Okay, and the thing that I really want you to do is to separate sequential and combinational logic. Now, there are many people who don't follow this coding style, but I really, um, uh, really, really, really want to suggest to, to follow this. It really helps you understand what you're doing, make sure that you're writing synthesizable RTL, and stay away from errors. So the thing is that we have uh, flip-flops in our design. Our flip-flops are the state of our design. They're the most important thing of our design. We should be best friends with our flip-flops. We should know who they are, know what their name is, and so forth. Each flip-flop will get 
its own usually always block and there will be a very simple always block that will just show you know the code that we showed before about the flip-flop no logic or as little logic as possible we don't want to have this always block doing all kinds of crazy operations we just want to have it have you know next state get, uh, state gets next state or q equals d or something like that and then we can really know what the name of the flip-flop is when it's synthesized it will have the same name as the left hand side signal here with an underscore reg that's the way you want to keep it really clean all of the combinational stuff is going to go into our next state variable and whatever is waiting to be sampled by the flip-flop on the positive edge and we'll put it in combinational blocks and the combinational blocks if they're long we should use a case um, if they're kind of complex with a lot of ifs and else use you know an always block if they're real simple use an assign um, that's the way uh, you should do it okay so those are our um, our kind of suggestions our guidelines and really if you follow coding styles things will be better for you never use assign statements that's a uh, really a bad thing to say assign statements are really nice um, to instead of writing these always combinatorial always blocks that maybe uh, just you know mess up our code a little <coughs> beep beep <coughs> which of the following will cause latch inference using star in your sensitivity list using a signal not in the sensitivity list on the right hand side using an if without an else in a sequential block assigning a z to the output of a flip-flop hmm. Gotta think about that. This one, or this one, or maybe this one? Well, I'll try this. And look, I got it right. Okay, so let me go back into our slides for a second, and let's see about inferring latches. So it's a really bad mistake that rookie um, hardware designers make as they uh, describe latches. Okay, you only sometimes find out when you synthesize the design and you have a warning of latch inference. A lot of people see that their, their code's actually working fine in their simulation, but they actually have a bunch of latches in there, which they really don't want, and their gate level won't work in the end. Okay, and the most important thing is really to have every single signal written out in your sensitivity list. Okay, so if we're missing a signal in the sensitivity list, um, the thing that's going to happen is we're going to have to have a latch to save that signal, and that's a really, really, really bad thing. Okay, um, so uh, again, so we want to have, um, I mean, sorry, that was our sensitivity list over here. Uh, another thing is that we could have a case, for example, that doesn't have. Um, all of its options. This has 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. What happens if we have 1, 1? Well, because there's this option, the synthesizer will have to put in a latch that will have to latch the output. Um, same thing with an if. If we have an if and the if doesn't have it else, well, what happens if we get the, the other condition inside the if? We have to save our previous state, and that, again, is a latch. Okay, so ifs have to have a latch. And it says here, stay away from tri-states as well. Um, we don't usually tend to put uh, Zs in our logic, okay? Um, so let's go over the answers over here. Using a star in your sensitivity list. Star is actually a uh, fail-safe way not to have latches due to uh, forgetting something in your sensitivity list. You just use a star, and the synthesizer or the, um, the simulation compiler will just take all of your right-hand side variables and stick them in your sensitivity list automatically. You don't have to write them explicitly. OK, um, using an if without an else in a sequential block. Well, I just said a minute ago that an if without an else exactly causes a latch to be inferred. However, it says here in a sequential block, if we had an if without an else, we're, uh, in a, if we had a sequential block, we're either trying to make a D uh, flip flop or a latch. And uh, you can write an if without an else. Uh, if you don't have a reset, for example, in your latch, you'll have an if without an else. We are trying to make a, uh, a flip flop or trying to infer a, a register. So um, it's okay to have an if without an else as long as we know what we're doing. Okay. And assigning a Z to the output of a flip flop. Well, I, I don't know why you'd exactly want to be doing that, but. Again, um, we're not trying to cause latch inference inside a flip-flop, and who knows why we would do that. And in general, assigning a Z is usually some sort of a tri-state, and we said we should stay away from those. But it's not the thing that's going to cause latch inference. It'll cause tri-state inference. Um, however, using a signal not in the sensitivity list on the right-hand side, that's the classic situation that causes latch inference, which is why we're actually going to be using star in our sensitivity list of our combinational blocks.
Which of the following statements is not synthesizable? It's not legal RTL. This one. This one. This one. Or this one. Well, I see it immediately. It's this initial. Okay. Let's go see what we had in our slides. We said that types of procedural blocks, there's an initial block and an always block. And we've just discussed always blocks a whole bunch. Initial blocks are executed only once at the first time uh, the unit is called. But this is only, only, only for test benches. Initial blocks do not work in um, RTL. They can be used for all kinds of debugging pur purposes with system calls, but that's not something that's synthesized. For real code, if we want to say initial begin A equals 0 and B equals 0, that's not something that you can do to uh, real logic. To get an initial value, you can use a reset signal and have a uh, resettable flip-flop or latch, but you cannot um, have uh, such an initial type of statement and expect it to be synthesized. So initial, as we see here, is something that is not synthesizable by definition. Um, we did see in the lecture that there is a way to define a, a two-dimensional array in this way. So reg 31 to 0, mem 0 to 7 is going to have 32 8-bit words uh, called mem. Okay, um, assign out equals cell uh, question mark A colon B is just our ternary um, way of writing a mux. Okay, and wire sign 19 to 0 result equals A times B. That's a, a way that we can write signed arithmetic um, as uh, I showed in the lecture. So these are all legitimate ways of writing things. This is not something that can be synthesized. And I took over first place, which is really nice, beating the machine. And here's our last question. What is wrong with the following statement? Assign next state equals reset n, question mark, start, or item. You cannot use ternary assignments on a next state variable. Never put logic on a reset symbol. Assign statements should use non-blocking assignments, or start and idle are not very long keywords. Well, they aren't very long keywords. I'm not sure about it. Maybe. Oh, that's it. Yeah, well, that's an important one. It was just in blue over here and not in red, and it should have been in red. Never put logic on a reset signal. So we also had one of our things that we wanted to stick with one reset type, either um, asynchronous reset or synchronous reset. And you want to stick with one of them. But the main thing is that not only you don't mix them in your design, but do not put logic on your reset signal. You are not supposed to do assign something equals A and reset. That is called putting logic on your reset signal. We put an AND gate between uh, a signal and reset. Okay? Or um, we have an always at star case state, and inside this we have on the right-hand side a reset. No using your uh, reset on the right-hand side. The only place re reset should be used is for resetting a flip-flop or a latch. Uh, and since we're not going to be making latches, it's only for resetting a flip-flop. Now, that being said, like many things that we say along the course, there are reasons to do all kinds of logic on reset. But they're not in uh, these early levels of uh, your design. At this point of your design, never, ever, ever put logic on reset. Remember that. Okay, so what about the other things here? Cannot use a ternary assignment on a next state variable. No, that's not true. Um, this is just uh, this over here. And it says assign next state. Next state is a string, right? Uh, it doesn't mean anything. But even if it did mean something, even there, if there was a next state, which was you know uh, just one bit or whatever, we could assign it with an assign. Usually the next state will have more than one bit because your state machine will be more than you know two states and then you will usually have a long case statement. But this is fine to do. Okay, uh, Assigned statements should use non-blocking assignment. Well, that's not true. Assigned statements always use this equals. Okay, Start and idle are not Verilog keywords. That's true. Start and idle are not Verilog keywords. We saw that we you know, used a local parameter, a parameter to encode start and idle to some sort of a value. So uh, start might be 0 and idle might be 1 or something like that. They're not Verilog keywords, but they, could be, they probably were somewhere in this code block parameterized. So that's fine. The only thing that you're, really we weren't supposed to do here was to put logic on a reset signal. So that was our... Um, Kahoot for our second lecture. And let's see, Robin, our virtual contestant, was in third place. Um, Mal was in second place. And guess what? This time I came out ahead. I only got eight. That's interesting enough. But, uh, okay, uh, you guys are, um, are invited to ask me questions on my YouTube channel. 
and thank you for your attention.